which I think it was back in the 1980s and whatnot, but it was much farther than that. But I'm, I want you to talk briefly about slavery and how some people are offensive language using Indians and three-fifths in the federal and state constitution there are at least 15 of the 50 that say that slavery can be used as a form of punishment when you commit a crime against the state. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, my brother, there's a lot of different dimensions to that question. You got slavery as a particular set of legal practices, slavery as a metaphor for other forms of subjugation, other mm -hmm. forms of domination. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no doubt that one can make a case that much of the, of the prison industrial complex is a mm -hmm. form of slavery. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. It's a form of slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes a lot to feel that out, but you can proceed down that road. Uh, what I would want to say is this, though. I mean, we've got the 13th Amendment, yes. No doubt about that. All it's just slavery across the board. It's in the U.S. Constitution and so on. But I think we always must look at this from the vantage point of social movement. <coughs> Whatever's in the Constitution what's not in the Constitution. Uh, what is most important is what is executed, what is done. There is in the Constitution right now a set of acts that call into question multinational corporate entity, the Sherman Act. Can they ever be actualized? Depends on whether they're organized. What is on paper is one thing. What comes alive on the ground is something else. You could pass a set of laws tomorrow that bar, discriminate, that bar discrimination against gay brothers, lesbians, sisters, Jews, Arabs, blacks, and so forth. But if white supremacist elites come to power, what's on that paper means very little. Because there's a gap between what's articulated in the Constitution and what is actually implemented on the ground with actual human beings with their own prejudices, prejudgments, presuppositions. You see. So that as much as, uh, where did my brother go? As much as we could talk about what's in the Constitution or what's not in the Constitution. Let's say, for example, you and I are successful in eliminating precisely that formulation in the Constitution that you're talking about. Well, if the Cheneys and others become more powerful, it's not going to make that big a difference. <laughs> because it could be a beautifully written constitution and your elites are acting <coughs> in highly problematic ways. And we could say that in, in other countries. The Soviet Union had one of the great constitutions in the world. But they still repressing rights and liberties. Everybody has the right to speak when they want to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Chinese got that in the Constitution right now. So what? You can't ex execute the thing. You can't implement the thing, you see. It's a question of whether you've got enough power and pressure to make sure that you make it real. So I'm not completely downplaying the fact of what's in there, but what is most important from the vantage point of social movements, and that is, I think, a crucial vantage point of the Kentucky Alliance. It's about activism, organization, mobilization, bringing power to bear, bringing pressure to bear. That's the key. <coughs> and that's what stands between new forms of oppression, new forms of slavery. Yes, my dear sister. Uh, Dr. West, I'm Shantree Martin from U of L. Yeah. I want to say first, thank you for coming. But my question is, how do you think is the talented test, because I believe that you believe we have an intellectual responsibility. How do you think we can help people struggling to get food, clothes, and shelter, like a mortal technique talks about, who don't have time to philosophize about democracy and things like that? What do you think we can do for direct action to get those people uh, basically in a better position so that their underprivileged status becomes non-existent? Mm -hmm. Appreciate the question. No. How are things University of Louisville these days? Uh, <laughs> brother, you, yes. you, you, you from yeah. the university too? Me too. What's your name, brother? Philip Bailey. Uh, Philip, it's good yeah. to have you out here. Thank you. Very much so. No, I think that the most important thing uh, one can do is to attempt to be an example. See, people would rather see a sermon <coughs> here one any day. You have to be an example, which is to say, I propose, I choose, I decide to be aware, alert person concerned about justice and compassion 
and everywhere I go, I allow that light to shine. Because in the end, no one liberates somebody else. People have to liberate themselves. In the end, nobody emancipates somebody else. Abraham Lincoln, the great emancipator, no, he was pushed to sign that thing. He wanted to win the war. Needed soldiers and so forth. Same is true for folk here in Louisville, same is true for folk in New York and so forth. In the end, the people win for themselves. And all we are is just extensions of people. That's what we are. That's what we are. When we had a dialogue tonight, expression one with the young folk, I said, I'm just an older person than you. Right? I was once young too. I'm just an extension of it. And so there's no sense of, well, somehow I have, have this special, mysterious magic of emancipating. No, 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 no. Thinking through, bearing witness, having courage, taking the time to organize, have, taking the time to mobilize, that's what does it. And one of the things that I would, I would love to see, and I think that it's becoming more and more apparent, young people, like you said, organizing among yourselves the way Snick did. Sister Ann could tell some stories about that. The way the Black Panther Party did. The way the League of Revolutionary Black Workers did. The way SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference did. We can go on and on and on. All of these were young people organizing. Right? And they were telling older brothers and sisters like me, you know what? You're outdated, antiquated, and anachronistic. <laughs> Time for you to move off the stage, let us on the stage. I like that kind of attitude. Because in the end, when they're serious about struggle, they recognize, wow, maybe we could learn something from these older folk. <laughs> They've been some things that we haven't been through. But once you reach that point, then you're ready for serious kind of coming together. Because young people have to take initiative. They have to think for themselves in their own terms. They have to be courageous in their own way. You see? And every generation has that, that challenge, this phenomenon. Said. And so I think that, uh, uh, the most important thing for yourself, the young person, be exactly what you, what you talked about. Courageous, visionary, humble, willing to sacrifice, tremendous intellectual discipline, political discipline, spiritual discipline, but most importantly, to have a sense of service. That's the key. That's the most important thing. Yes, indeed. Any other questions? Yes, that's why we had a Um You touched on a while ago talking about Abraham Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation, mm -hmm. post-slavery. <coughs> um, along that vein, many um, ex-slaves became Republicans because they felt that Abraham Lincoln freed them and so forth and so on. And many present-day black Republicans will use that uh, historical data to say, well, you remember uh, Abraham Lincoln and black people were Republicans at that time. Um, do you personally see or feel or project a contradiction for African Americans uh, joining the Republican Party? Joining the Republican Party? Uh huh. <laughs> well, two things quickly. One is that you're absolutely right about black people joining the, the, the party of Lincoln because the Democratic Party at that, that time was such a white supremacist party mm -hmm. in an extremist form. That was true up until 1932. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a slow shift that black people made. And of course, even during the Civil Rights Movement, the Democratic Party was still so deeply shaped by its southern elites that it had a white supremacist slant that made it difficult for black folk to openly embrace the Democratic Party, even given in the fact that FDR had been head of it. See. But I have such a deep suspicion of both parties. So what? Deep suspicion of both parties. It's hard to find my answer to my dear sister here. Who in both parties can we actually highlight being visionary, courageous, truth-telling, witness-bearing, concerned about justice? I mean, there's a few, but there's not too many. Because the system itself has become so saturated with big money and conformity and narrow com perception and so forth, you see. Uh, the political system itself, I mean, Russell Feingold says the system of legalized bribery and normalized corruption. That's what we're dealing with.